Have you ever noticed how you could outline the whole Bible solely around Israel? This is what I wrote down. From Genesis to Deuteronomy, those five books declare God chooses them as his people. Remember he says, I I chose you above all peoples on the earth, not because you were bigger or better, but because I loved you. So those five books declare God chooses Israel as his people. Then from Joshua to Esther, those books declare God gives them his land. I mean, he gave it to them from the Euphrates to the river Egypt, and he said, I'm going to defend it, and you will never lose a battle if you... Let me fight it for you. Then from Psalms, the Messianic Psalms, and and all the way through Malachi, those books declare that God promises them a future. He has future plans for them. In fact, a lot of those books were written as they were falling into captivity. And so God says, I promise you a future. So he chooses them, he gives them, he promises them. Then from Matthew through the book of Jude, those books declare that God uses them as his ambassadors. Remember, Every book we have in here is written either directly by an Israeli or under the direct auspices of an Israeli like Luke, who was not a Jew, but uh, God used him. And then that one chapter Nebuchadnezzar got to write in Daniel chapter 4. But other than that, God uses the, the nation of Israel and the people of Israel as his ambassadors from Matthew to Jude. And then finally in Revelation, God declares he's going to finish his plan for them. So if you want to outline all 66 books, first five, God chooses them as his people. Uh, the next about 15, God gives them his land. The, the next few to finish off the 39, God promised them his future. Then the first 26 books of the New Testament, God is using Israel as his ambassadors. And then finally, Revelation, God finishes his plan. Well, all 66 books of God's word in one framework, Israel. So go sit in front of Albertson and you'll have similar ideas. Okay, just teasing. During the last few centuries, the world, and we Christians included, have fallen into a very bad habit. In fact, if you notice this, tomorrow in the newspaper, you'll see this terrible habit. Listen to the radio tomorrow, the news. You'll hear an awful habit the world's gotten into. We have bought into some early Roman propaganda. We have begun to use the name Palestine. Where did that word come from? Well, the Roman emperor Hadrian, in 130 AD, chose that word as his ultimate act as he decimated and tried to extinguish the Jewish people off the planet. We'll talk about him more. But since 130 A.D., that word has become more and more common in usage. It's about as incorrect as calling Russia today the Soviet Union or calling Berlin East Germany. I mean, nobody would do that. You'd all be acting like you're in a time warp. But people today regularly say the word Palestine. There's a reason for it. Let me just give you a brief history of the term Palestine. Where did the term originate? Well, the world and the church got into this habit of calling the land of Israel Palestine. And the reason is this. In, in 130 AD, Hadrian, the one that built Hadrian's Arch and the one that built the Pantheon, if you've ever been to Rome, all the, I mean, a lot of the stuff he built is still working. I mean, aqueducts, he was a master builder, built in stone. But he suppressed the revolt of the Jews in 130, and by 135, he came to Jerusalem, and he said, I'm going to stop the Jews from ever revolting again. Remember, they they revolted uh, in in the time of uh, Julius Caesar, then they revolted again in the time of Titus and and, uh, Vespasian, and then they revolted again the final time in 130. He said, I'm going to stop all this. So he came and actually leveled the whole city of Jerusalem, and over every Christian monument, the Christ tomb and the the uh, church uh, that was built over the where the Dome of the Rock is now. That Dome of the Rock, by the way, is actually on the foundation of a Christian church that was built in the Byzantine time. You'll never hear CNN say that, but uh, it, I will say it. But he built a pagan shrine over every Christian shrine, which helps us today know where all the Christian shrines are, because he built these towering rock edifices in 130 over every Christian shrine, and then changed the name of Jerusalem to Aya Capitolina. And, and then he, he dedicated it to the gods for this reason. He wanted to erase the Jews. How did he pick Palestine? Palestine means 
Philistine. It's a Latinization of the word Philistine. Now, in just a minute, I'm going to tell you that no Palestinian today is at all related to a Philistine. The Philistines were from Greece. Where are the Palestinians from? They're all from Jordan uh, and Iraq and Lebanon. And all of them are of Arab descent. They're all of Hamitic descent and uh, Ishmaelite descent and, and, and the, the mixing somewhat of Sh- Semites and Shem's descendants. But none of them are from Japheth. And that's where the Philistines are from. The Philistines are from Greece and Crete. So they're... It really doesn't work, Philistine and, and the modern Arabs. But why did he pick that term? Well, do you remember the titanic conflict between a little Jewish boy and a big Philistine, Goliath? And the, the big Philistine fell to the little boy, David. And so from that time on, the Philistines were on their, their way out, and slowly David ascended and basically destroyed them, and they were, in the generations to come, totally gone. Although this month's National Geographic chronicles that the Philistines were about the most advanced cosmopolitan people of the ancient world. Absolutely on the cutting edge of everything, technology, everything. But the little boy, Jew, defeated the big Philistine. And so what did Hadrian call the land? He called it after the defeated ones, the Philistines, as a constant scourge and a mockery of the victors, the Jews. And he said, I'm going to name this land and forever make it a disparagement. He says, I'm going to wipe Israel out of history. And he said, this land will never again be called Israel. In fact, until Hadrian's time, the land was called Israel, Judea, and Samaria. It was always called by those names. No one called it Palestine until 135 A.D. with him. Well, Hadrian's selection of Palestine was purposeful. It was not accidental. He took the name of Israel's ancient enemies, the Philistines. He Latinized it to Palestine. He applied it to the land of Israel. And he desired to erase the name of Israel from all memory. Thus, the term Palestine, as applied to the land of Israel, was invented by the inveterate enemy of the Bible and of the Jewish people, Hadrian. Who, by the way, was one in a long line of successors of the Roman Empire, which would be capped off with who? the Antichrist, the ultimate Caesar, who's coming. And so Hadrian was just playing his part that Satan had given him by calling it Palestine. Well, it's interesting to note, as I mentioned, the original Philistines were not Middle Eastern at all. They were European peoples from the Adriatic Sea next to Greece. It pleased Hadrian to utilize a Greek term for the Jewish land. Now, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles with me because I'm going to show you why God never calls this place Palestine. He has a different name for it. And we'll start in Leviticus 25, 23. So turn in your Bibles to Leviticus 25 and uh, verse 23. Leviticus 25, 23. And I have these bold and highlighted in my Bible because this is what God thinks of that land that he named Israel. The Israelites didn't name it. God says, it's my land and I'm calling it Israel. And CNN... And the UPI and the Associated Press and all the media of the world have stood with the Antichrist's designate, Hadrian, and they want to call it Palestine because they want to erase Israel off the map. I mean, up until a few weeks ago, you couldn't even find Israel on the CNN map. I mean, they didn't have it on there until a bunch of people squawked. And uh, they put it back on. But they even erase it off the weather map. They don't like Israel. And it's a part of the end times because God has staked his name on those people Israel. Leviticus 25, 23, the land must not be sold permanently and certainly not given away in peace deals. Why? Verse 23, because the land is mine. Who's speaking? God. Now turn to 2 Chronicles. Keep going to the right. These are all to the right in your Bible. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 20 of 7 says this, 2 Chronicles 7, 20, I will uproot Israel from my land. Israel, the nation, Israel is two things. It's a people and it's a place. And the Bible talks about both inextricably. It's a nation, a people, a group of people, a, a, a group of descendants that God selected and kept narrowing down Uh, Abraham and then his grandson Jacob renamed him to Israel, gave him 12 sons, and they populated and conquered this land and, and all after the Exodus. But he said, I will uproot the group of people, Israel, from my land. 
but it's still my land, which I have given them, and I will reject the temple I consecrated for my name. I will make it a byword and object of ridicule among all people. Now, fast to the right to Isaiah. So all the way through, and now we're in the promise section I told you about. God makes him a lot of future promises. Isaiah 14, in verse 25. And we're looking at Palestine. Whose land is it? Number one, there is no Palestine. And number two, it's God's. And he calls it Israel. And let me show you another verse. It says, Isaiah 14, 25. I will crush the Assyrian in my land. Assyrians from Nineveh, that's Iran, uh, later became the Persian Empire. But I will crush the Assyrian in my land, on my mountains, I will trample him down. His yoke will be taken from my people, and his burden removed from their shoulders. Now, in one verse, God calls the inhabitants of Israel, my people, and he calls the mountains of Israel, my mountains, and he calls the whole place of Israel, my land. One verse. He says all that. Next book, Jeremiah 2. Keep going to the right. Isaiah, Jeremiah chapter 2. And verse 7. God is speaking through Jeremiah the prophet. By the way, he was the prophet of of the weeping prophet who was there as the southern, the last remnant of Israel was, was carried off in three successive captivities by Nebuchadnezzar the Babylonian. And now Babylon is from Iraq. Remember, Assyria was from Iran. And then the Iraqis modern Iraq is all around the land of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar land. In fact, uh, Saddam Hussein fancies himself the second Nebuchadnezzar. He actually, he's actually rebuilt Nebuchadnezzar's palace, and he goes and has banquets in Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonians' palace, and he says there he's the second Nebuchadnezzar. It doesn't believe the Bible, of course, but he's trying to reenact the Bible. Okay, look at, look at uh, Jeremiah 2.7. He says, I, I brought you from a fertile land, uh, rich in produce, and as Jeremiah's writing this, the Babylonians are marching down to destroy it, but you came and defiled my land. Now, now don't have any misconceptions. The current leaders of Israel are about as, as ungodly and immoral as Manasseh and Ahaz and the rest of the rotten kings. There is, there is no holiness in Israel. And therefore, Christians quickly dismiss them. They are, even in their unbelief and sin, God's people, chosen people, his ambassadors to the world. You know what God said? They will never, never be annihilated. They are always my people, distinct from us, the church, separate from us, the church, future in God's plan to be the head of all the nations. Those infidels, I mean, they are infidels. They don't believe in the true and living God. They believe in themselves and their military and their, their right now, their, their ability to sway public opinion. They don't trust in the living God, by and large. Now, some do. But he says, you've, you've defiled my land, and, and in some senses, they still are and made my inheritance detestable. That's why God is allowing even now such hardship to them. Look at verse 18 of chapter 16 of Jeremiah. Keep going to the right. Jeremiah 16, 18. I will repay them double for their wickedness and their sin, because they have defiled my land with lifeless forms of their vile images, have filled my inheritance with their detestable idols. That's a little bit of why God expelled them from the land, uh, because of their idolatry. But you notice what he says in 16, 18. My land, my inheritance. Now the next book, uh, after this, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Look at Ezekiel 38, 16. This is uh, what's going to be in the newspapers in the not-too-distant future. Ezekiel 38, 16. Uh, the northern armies, the, the, the constant enemies of Israel. All of Israel's uh, worst enemies came from the north. They always came from the north. The Assyrians came from the north. The Babylonians came from the north. The Greeks came from the north. The Romans came from the north and from the west. Uh, once the Babylonians under Shishak or Shishak came up from the south, but all the other, and the Ethiopians. But other than those little fights, all of Israel's mortal enemies came from the north. Well, look at Ezekiel thirty-eight sixteen. You will advance against my people, Israel, like a cloud that covers the land. In days to come, so when Ezekiel wrote this, in exile, Ezekiel wrote this after Israel was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, he was looking at a future day. 
He said, you're going to come like a cloud against my people Israel. O Gog, I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I show myself holy through you before their eyes. That event has never taken place. And if, if you read all the rest of Ezekiel, that group of nations that come is southern Russia, Turkey, and the, what are now the breakaway Soviet republics that have all become Muslim. By the way, where did the prime minister or the dictator, whatever he is, of Russia just move their nuclear ballistic missiles this week? He moved them down into the area around the Caspian and around the southern parts of Russia. He's moving them slowly south. Isn't that interesting? It says here that they're going to be coming probably with their armaments. And God says, when you advance against my people and against my land, read the rest of Ezekiel 38, he says, I'm going to wipe you out. Amazing. Russia and her allies. Now keep going to Joel, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, to the right. Uh, Chapter 3, verse 2. Very, very interesting verse. God says, through Joel, Joel's writing uh, six to seven hundred years before Christ. We're talking about 26, 2700 years ago. And as Joel's writing, Israel was nothing but a backwoods, backwater has been. I mean, they were so far from uh, the glories of David and Solomon and the resurgence of Jeroboam II when he expanded the borders. They were just nothing. There's no natural resources there. There's really no reason Jerusalem is, is nothing. There's nothing in Jerusalem that's worthwhile other than that God picked it. Uh, nothing natural, that is, only supernatural. But when Joel wrote this, look, look what he says in chapter 3, verse 2. I, I can just, many times I've stood in the Mount of Olives and looked across the Kidron Valley at Jerusalem and thought about Joel, whose tomb is on the Mount of Olives, and thought about him sitting in some little stone two-room Jerusalem house at a little table with a flickering oil lamp and, and writing down as the Spirit of God inspired him these words. Now, can you imagine in this this broken down um, third world nation, as we would call it, falling apart near its last gasp of life before it's going to be hauled off into captivity and trampled under the nations, Joel must have scratched his head as he wrote these words, I will gather all nations. God doesn't exaggerate. We are prone to. God doesn't. I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I'm sure that Joel must have leaned forward and looked out his window because the valley of Jehoshaphat is a confluence where the Kidron Valley and the valley of Hinnom meet, right at the base of the city of David. The city of David is like a wedge, and the end of the wedge where the king's gardens were of David and Solomon and the early monarchies, right there where those two meet is a little flat area that's called the valley of Jehoshaphat where Hinnom and Kidron meet. And he, and he must have leaned forward and looked out his window and thought, huh, all the nations are going to come to there, the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I, Jehovah God, will enter into judgment against them concerning my inheritance, my people Israel, for they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. Joel scratched his head and looked out there and saw the smoke from the dumps. By the way, Hinnom Valley is where we get Gehenna from. That was the garbage valley. That was the landfill, as we call it today. And they just dumped all their stuff there and let it be a 24-hour day, seven day a week, 365 days a year, fire. There's just smoldering fire. And that's where they threw bodies of criminals. That's where they burned babies to their false gods. That was just a wicked place. And he looked down at that smoldering thing And he says, huh, every nation's going to come down there. Amazing. Here's the last one, Zechariah chapter 2. And you can just park in Zechariah. We're going to stay there the rest of the night as I run through this. But Zechariah 2. And now you understand in verse 12 how important this land is to God. Okay? And we're going to go from chapter 2 to chapter 12. Zechariah 2. Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah 2, verse 12. And the Lord, this is Jehovah, 
this is the Ancient of Days, the Endless One, will take possession of Judah. That's what it was always called up until 135 A.D. As his inheritance in the Holy Land. That's where that comes from. You ever heard of the Holy Land? That's not a tourist slogan. That's what the God of the universe, the creator of all things, that's what he has his eye on in his title deed, stake. It's put right down on one of the hills of Jerusalem. Mount Moriah is one of the hills. Mount of Olives is another of the hills. And Mount Zion is the other hill. And God stuck his stake in Zion. He says, that's my holy land. Look at verse 13. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord. For he is aroused from his holy habitation. God is jumping up, as it were, from the quietness of his courts in heaven. And he says, you've done enough. That's my land. And I'm coming to get it back. And we're going to see in just a minute what he's going to do. Let's bow together. Oh, Lord, it's so thrilling to think that of all the people who have lived from the Garden of Eden to this evening, that we actually live in a time which has never been closer to the pages of your word. Our newspapers read like those dusty scrolls of the Hebrew prophets. Our newspapers read like they're fresh from the inkwell of Zechariah, of Ezekiel, of Jeremiah, and of Daniel. Our newspapers read like your sermon from the Mount of Olives and like Paul's promises of the last days. And we already know and we've studied what we're supposed to live like. We're supposed to live taking people with us. We're to live expectantly and hopefully and and as witnesses, but it's also very thrilling to think that your ancient promises are actually unfolding before our eyes and that you have your people back in your land in unbelief and before long they're going to be in belief. And what a horrible time is going to be on this planet as Jacob's troubles unfold. Oh Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be wise, you'd help us to sense the times And you'd help us to worship you who control the future and get in step with your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's go to chapter 12 and sit there for a moment before I read it and listen to this. Palestinians. How many hundreds of times a day do you hear that word? Palestinians. There never was a Palestinian people, never has been, never will be. It's a total fabrication of the networks. There's never been a Palestinian nation. There's never been a Palestinian language. There's never been a Palestinian culture. There's never been a Palestinian religion. The claim on the news media of a descent from a Palestinian people who lived in Israel thousands of years ago called Palestine by the Philistines is is really a hoax. The land was Canaan before Israel got there. It was inhabited by Canaanites whom God destroyed because of their wickedness. And Canaan became the land of Israel. And About a thousand years later, the Philistines came. Now, there were some early people called in Genesis Philistines, the Philistine princes, but those were people that live in an area that was on the coast that was called Philistia. But in 1200 B.C., Encyclopedia Britannica, look it up, a group of people called the Sea People from the the Greek civilizations came around the coasts of the Mediterranean, and those Greek, brilliant, metallurgists, warriors, Pottery makers, writers, city builders moved in along what is today the Gaza Strip and built five massive cities. These people were so technically advanced, they would kind of be like an American corporation landing in a 747 and unloading their stuff in the center of Mongolia. That's how much more advanced they were than all the peoples around them. Those were the, if you want to have Palestinians, the Philistines. But those are not at all the people that are called Palestinians today. The people today called Palestinians are Arabs by birth, by language, by culture, and are close relatives to the Arabs in the surrounding countries, whence most of them, attracted by Israel's prosperity, came. In fact, the name Palestine is Philistine. They are not Semitic. 
They are not the Jews who invaded Canaan from, I mean the Philistines who invaded Canaan from Crete and other parts of Asia Minor. Yet, their leader, Yasser Arafat, claims that. Yasser Arafat, by the way, was born in Jordan or in Egypt. He's not Palestinian either. He's Egyptian, actually, if you want to know the truth. But as previously noted, history records that in AD 131-35, the Romans seeking to destroy Israel, number one, massacred 500,000 Jews. Almost every inhabitant of the city of Jerusalem was put to the sword in 130 AD. The rest were sold into slavery, and the Romans angrily renamed Israel Palestina as a vengeful act against the Jews. And the Jews living in that land became known as Palestinians. Now, wait a minute. You read. Go, go get some old magazines. Up until 1964, the Jews were called Palestinians. In fact, who fought in World War II? What was the Palestinian Brigade of World War II? Any of you history buffs? They were all Jews. What was the Palestinian Symphony that played up through 1948 all over the world? They were Jews. The Palestinians were just called by that Roman name, but they were all Jews, and they inhabited old Israel. But then in 1964, the designs of the Antichrist coming began to take form, and in 1964, what is the Jewish claim to Israel? It goes back 4,000 years to Abraham, actually 4,100 years. What is the Palestinian, in quotes, claim to Israel? It goes back 36 years to the year 1964. When they decided as a publicity purpose, a propaganda tool, that they would claim that they were the original inhabitants of the land. They weren't. Only 3% of Israel was inhabited by Arabs in, that were dispelled in the 1948 war, but that's just history. Israel's claim goes back 4,000 years to Abraham. Abraham purchased the cave of Machpelah in Hebron. There, Sarah, Abraham, Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, and Leah are buried. In Hebron, David was crowned the king of Israel. That is a sacred Jewish site which has no relationship at all to any Arab or Muslim Yet the Muslims claim Hebron is their city. They built their mosque to keep Jews and Christians from coming to the cave and are determined to drive out every Jewish resident. Why? Why such animosity of the Muslims against the Jews? All throughout history, there has been a perpetual desire of Satan to destroy God's chosen people. Cain, inhabited by Satan, desired to destroy Abel. Then, he couldn't do it that way, so Satan sent his demons down to defile the race so there would be no pure bloodline, so the Messiah couldn't come. And so God found one family that was righteous in his eyes that were not defiled, Noah's family. He destroyed everybody else, and they kept going. Then God picked out of Noah's descendants Shem, and out of Shem's descendants Abraham. But Abraham was too in a hurry. And he couldn't figure out God's plan, so he went down and got an Egyptian handmaid and spawned the Ishmaelites, who had 12 kingdom tribes, which became the ancestors of all the modern Arabs. And God sought to have a true, pure seed, but Abraham got in a hurry, as whenever we're in a hurry. God's never in a hurry, but when we're in a hurry, we usually cause problems. And so then became the conflict between Ishmael and the son of promise, Isaac. And God confirmed his covenant with Isaac. Abraham sent Ishmael off. And on went the line until we get Jacob and Esau. Again, two fighting each other. And Esau became the father of the Edomites. And you run time forward to the time of Christ. It was an Edomite sitting on the throne illegally, of Israel, by the name of Herod. Herod was a direct descendant of Esau. And Jesus was a direct descendant of Jacob. And here's Jacob's son meeting Esau's son. And Esau's son, Herod, tried to kill Jacob's son. See, it's never ended. There's always been Satan behind the scenes trying to destroy Christ coming. And that's exactly what's happening today in the Middle East. It's not about oil, it's not about land, it's not about water, it's really not about religion. 
It's all about Satan wanting to destroy the people that are inextricably attached to the whole Bible and every plan that God has for the future of this planet, the Jews. And all that we see unfolding before our eyes, the last 37 years of propaganda in the newspapers, has made the whole world think that the Palestinians are the true possessors of the land, where God's claim to that goes way back to Abraham 4,000 years ago. Well, for 3,000 years, Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. The Temple Mount is on the summit of Mount Moriah, which is the heart of Jerusalem. The 35-acre parcel arouses so much passion that it will probably trigger World War III at any time. This is where Abraham built an altar to offer his own son Isaac to God. This is the spot that King David purchased from Ornan, the Jebusite, to build there an altar to God. This is where Solomon built the first temple to God. And this is where the Dome of the Rock a monument to Islam's unbiblical and irrational claim that Abraham offered not Isaac, but Ishmael. And that's the center of the focus of the world. Why? Well, because God picked one group of people to stake his name on. Let me just real quickly, before I... I'm going to read you um, God's plan for Israel in just a moment. But let me just give you some modern history for three minutes, and then I'll finish up. Let me just tell you about how the modern rebirth of Israel occurred. After all those centuries of, after Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Israel, they were dispersed, they came back, but they never again regained any prominence because God was not ready for them to return. Then they kind of inhabited the land with all these different Idumean and other rulers and Romans and Greeks and everything, but basically they languished until our lifetime, many of us, and some of you, and close to my lifetime, until 1948. And on May 14, 1948, David Ben-Gurion declared Israel was a nation. The moment he declared that, 2,000 years of wandering ended, and they got that land back that they had not had since the time of Christ. And a half a million descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lifted their little Star of David flag, a half a million, and instantly 40 million Arabs, Muslims, began coming toward them to destroy them. Did you know that's what happened in 1948? 40 million against a half a million. You know history. As soon as Israel proclaimed their independence, they were attacked by Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Saudi Arabia, as well as the Iraqi reserves. And they determined to drive the Jews in the sea. And from February 24th to July 20th, invasion after invasion after invasion occurred. And in every one of them, you know history, the Arabs were defeated. At great cost, the Jews, there are half a million of them, 6,000 of them died. You know what, that's, what that means? That's like 3%. That would be like 5 what would it be? Five, six, seven, eight point four million Americans dying. That would get your attention, wouldn't it? Today, if eight point four million of us died. That happened in those few weeks. Finally, ceasefires were signed with all the Arab nations in nineteen forty eight. Eight years went by, and if you ever heard of Nasser, the uh, leader of Egypt, he declared on july twenty sixth, nineteen fifty six, that Egypt was going to attack Israel. Eight years later. And they did. They gave them some notice in July. They said, we're going to attack. They finally got around to attacking on October 29th of the same year. And in that fight, Israel overpowered Egypt, the largest Arab nation, and drove them all the way back to the Suez Canal, crossed the Suez Canal, and the United States had to make them stop, or they would have taken over Cairo. It was amazing. They took 6,000 Egyptians prisoner, and Israel only lost 181 and had one prisoner taken, and they defeated the largest Arab nation. So they all kind of died down until 1967. And by 1967, Egypt was declaring that they were going to burn Israel in flames. In fact, he even put out, the Egyptian leader put out a stamp with his face on it and his hand on Israel, and Israel totally in flames. And he had mobilized an army, 
80,000 Egyptians were on the border, 40,000 Syrians, 40,000 Jordanians, 20,000 Saudi Arabians, 5,000 Iraqis, and on May 22nd they announced that Israel was banned from any shipping, they closed every port, put their ships out and blockaded the harbor, and Israel was hemmed in on every side, 20 to 1 outnumbered in everything, with the Soviet Union now stepping in, and Russia, if you know anything about 1967, sent 450 of the latest jets, the MiG-21s at that time, they're not any good now, 240 surface-to-air missile sites, all manned by Russian soldiers. They put in 15,000 pilots and missile men and tank drivers. The Russians were really committed to this operation. They sent in billions of dollars of supplies. And you all know what happened. It was the shortest war in history. When Israel's radar picked up the first flight of enemy bombers, they locked a preemptive strike, went out over the ocean, came in behind the Egyptian lines, and all of Egypt's Air Force, Jordan's, and Syria's were destroyed on the ground before they could get their fighters off the ground. And in six days, Israel defeated 30 nations. Every Arab nation had contributed, as well as Russia, to this. The shortest war in history, June 5th to 10th, and in that six-day war, Israel captured enough material that supplied their army for months. Well, you know, 1973 was another war. Israel won again at great cost. But modern Israel today that you read about in the newspapers has one-sixth of one percent of all the lands that the Arabs have. It has no, no oil wealth. It has no strategic importance other than it's God's city that he planned to put his name on. And even though in unbelief they won in 48, 56, 67, and 73, and even though since 73 they've gone backward, 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 backward till they're giving it all back plus more, the latest Barak, Ehud Barak proposal was to give back all of the captured land plus a little extra. All. God still has plans for them. Let me just read you this. It's my list that we're going to finish up soon, I hope. Someone said, when are you ever going to finish your list? Soon. Six points. Here it is. If you want to know where we're going, God picked his chosen people, number one. Number two, God presented a land to his chosen people, and he clearly defined the boundaries. Number three, God proceeded to bring his chosen people to that. That's called the Exodus. So he picked them, he presented them a land, promised them, and then he proceeded to bring them to that land. So God has mapped this out. Number four, God pronounced a curse on them if they wouldn't believe him, and they didn't. God preserved them from annihilation. You want to read anything fascinating? Read the history of the Jews. They have been more sought out, hunted, and butchered than any group that's ever lived on the planet. And yet they always survive. Why? Because God picked them. God promised them. God's preserving them. God has a plan for them. Finally, God promised to regather his chosen people. And that's why we're in chapter 12. And let me read... The last three verses tonight, Zechariah 12, 1 through 3. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord, who stretched out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, who forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. Remember, God doesn't exaggerate. Let me ask you, why is it that Israel's in the news every day? Let me just tell you one thing. Between 1948 and tonight, ten times more people have been murdered in New York City than have ever died in any murder or attack or any explosion in Israel. Ten times. Do you hear about New York City every day? Do you hear every person that's grisly, cut up, and shot, and butchered in New York City? No. What do you hear about? This land. Why? Verse 3. I'm going to make Jerusalem a heavy stone. It's going to be squashing people. It's going to be bothering people. It's going to make them scared. The whole world is going to be drunk with fear because it's a heavy stone. Why? Because God picked them. God presented them a land. He brought them to the land. He pronounced a curse on them if they wouldn't believe. He preserved them in their unbelief. He regathered them until they believe in him. And you and I are going to witness that as the days unfold ahead.
Let's bow before our great God as Zechariah described him, and I hope that uh, these words will be precious in your sight. Let's bow before our Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, and who formed the spirit of man within him, our creator. Let's bow before him. Father in heaven, and your Son, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, we don't fully understand the suffering that has gone on in that land, both the Palestinian so-called peoples, the Jewish peoples, the Arabs, and all the others. But we do know this, that they are a part of the inexorable struggle that goes on until thy will is done on earth as it is in heaven. So we pray that your will will be done on earth. Starting with us, help us to be careful to always remember every time we see that word Palestine, to remember that's part of the plan of that future Roman dictator who will control the world, who will fool Israel again, and who will lead them to near annihilation, and then you're going to come back. Oh, Lord Jesus, come quickly for us, your church. Come in seven years for your people as you bring them to belief and as they turn back to you in faith. Until then, help us to be confident. Help us to sense the time. Help us to trust in you who have written the future in your word. And we'll thank you for Jesus' precious sake, we pray. Amen.